gives me great pleasure to uh, invite up to the stage yet another Bostonian. Forgive me, I know there's a Patton, Senator Warren, Tom Curry, and now Stevie Antonakis, who I've also known for years. It's a, a long run of Massachusetts or Boston Banking Commission. As I gotta tell you, I mean, I just sit there and I talk about the history with both Tom Curry and now with Steve Antonakis about what, what occurred in Boston. And it's just, it's just amazing how, how blessed we are in that state to have people who are really sensitive to the, ki to the kinds of things that we believe in. And I, and I know that I have another number of uh, folks from Massachusetts here who can uh, verify that that's the case. So Steve Antonakis is the deputy director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, he currently serves as the de deputy director as well, uh, uh, sorry, the associate director for enforcement supervision and fair lending at the CFPB. So he's responsible for the supervision of all banks and non-banks under the CFPB's, uh, CFPB's jurisdiction in the enforcement of the federal consumer protection and fair lending laws. Uh, he began his professional career, as I mentioned, in Boston as a, as a bank examiner. So he's actually been in this field for quite a while and um, subsequently got uh, appointed to different positions in Massachusetts. Um, uh, one of the things I do like to mention about him, that because it, because it's my alma mater, is that he received his doctorate. Do we have to call you Dr. Antonakis? Okay. Uh, from Northeastern University, my alma mater. So please join me and give a warm welcome to Steve Antonakis. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. So thank you. Good afternoon. It, it is a real pleasure to be here. It's great uh, to see John. We've known each other for a number of years. Uh, he alluded to a little bit uh, of my background. Uh, you know, followed every boyhood dream, become a bank examiner. You know, it's uh, <laughs> You know, I, I kind of, I've told some folks this, but I learned the hard way that, at least when I started work, when you try to explain someone in the bank regulatory field what you do for a living, it's a surefire way to make sure, to find out you're essentially by yourself at a cocktail party. Uh, that started to change. Um, the best indication for me that it was changing was in early 2008. This was uh, after Bear, but before Lehman, so still fairly you know, early, perhaps, in the days uh, of the financial crisis. I think many of us had a sense for what perhaps might be coming, but really weren't sure of the depth of, of what was yet to come. And I was still working uh, in Massachusetts, uh, took, the, uh, took the commuter train into Boston every day, uh, bought the uh, papers uh, at a local convenience store in the morning. And Boston's still a two-paper town. I would buy the Republican and Democratic papers, primarily to see if I'd been fired the night before. And um, at this convenience store, there was this steady flow of people coming in and out every day, buying cigarettes, buying lottery tickets, papers, gas, whatever the case may be. And on one particular morning, uh, I found myself alone in the convenience store with a woman who worked behind the counter. And, you know, I wore a suit and tie to work every day. And she looked at me and she said, what do you do for a living anyway? And I thought, to back to all those cocktail parties. And, uh, you know, I paused for a moment. I said, well, you know, I said, I work for the government in bank and mortgage regulation. And she looked at me stone-faced and said, your job must suck. <laughs> And I thought, that's interesting. Um, I, I, you know, the, the, my first thought was, you know, the depth of the crisis that we're about to undergo has permeated the American public more than perhaps we appreciate. Uh, and then my second thought was, we've gotten to the point that the woman working the graveyard shift at the local convenience store feels badly for me, and that was somewhat, <laughs> somewhat disturbing. Um, it, it really is a, is a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, the opportunity to speak at your annual conference. Certainly, uh, the Bureau, the Consumer Bureau, has benefited significantly uh, from our working relationship with NCRC on issues ranging from consumer protection to access to credit. And we really thank you for your continued partnership in many respects. Uh, the work you day, do uh, day in and day out to better serve the nation's most vulnerable consumers, including those in low-income communities and communities of color, should really stand as an inspiration to all of us. Like you, we at the Bureau are working hard to improve the consumer financial markets. Our, our mission, quite simply, is to make markets for consumer financial products and services work for Americans. Uh, above all, this means ensuring that consumers get the information they need to make financial decisions that are best for themselves and ultimately best for their families. 
Events like this conference enhance our collaboration and I'm confident will move us towards our shared goal of protecting consumers. Now John gave you an indication of my background, 24 years uh, in bank regulation, started as a, actually as a Community Reinvestment Act and Fair Lending Examiner, not just a bank examiner, and uh, then had the great fortune to serve later uh, as Tom Curry, who spoke to you earlier today, when he was the then Commissioner of Banks in Massachusetts, served nine years as his deputy, which is probably about as good an apprenticeship as, as anyone could ask for before succeeding him and serving seven years as the Commissioner of Banks in Mass. We had a uh, fairly broad mandate, not only safety and soundness, but consumer protection, community reinvestment, and fair lending, and we also oversaw banks, uh, credit unions, and non-banks in the Commonwealth. Now, uh, you know, I always think it's important to stress that at the Bureau, while our focus and mandate is on consumer protection, you know, we do, uh, uh, you know, care very much about the safety and soundness and the financial health of the uh, financial industries that we do, in fact, oversee. And I can tell you, having lived through now two banking crises, that in my view, unequivocally, consumer protection does not conflict with safety and soundness. Consumers benefit from a healthy, competitive, oh, thank you. Consumers benefit from a healthy and competitive and diversified financial syst uh, services system through greater access to credit and ultimately competitive pricing. We hold that banks, credit unions, and non-banks should be treated alike and receive similar oversight if they offer the same types of financial products and services. Accordingly, we want responsible businesses playing by the rules to succeed free of unfair pressure from predatory competitors. Ultimately, both financial and consumer compliance performance are dependent upon strong management. Seldom do institutions excel in one area and not the other. No business built on deceiving its customer base will be sustainable. Moreover, when businesses underinvest in compliance management systems, it can pose significant reputational and financial risks. Certainly, there is no better evidence in the banking industry's ongoing recovery from years of significant underinvestment in both mortgage origination and mortgage servicing. Now, since we've opened our doors, our consumer response team has received over 300,000 complaints. Just last month, we received more than 31,700 calls and handled, handled more than 21,000 complaints. Debt collection is now our largest source of complaints. We receive approximately 6,200 debt collection complaints a month. Mortgage complaint volume, however, remains high, about 4,300 complaints a month on mortgage issues. Now, complaints are not only opportunities for us to assist specific people, they also make a difference by informing our work and helping us identify problems that then feed into our supervision and enforcement prioritization process. Now, I know that many of you in NCRC's extensive housing counseling network have helped your com clients file complaints with us. And I will say thank you very much for helping us to help more consumers. Anyone can file a complaint with us at our website, which is www.consumerfinance.gov or call our multilingual hotline, which is 855-411-CFPB. Again, that's 855-411-CFPB. Our Ask CFPP tool is another valuable resource for consumers with over 1,000 questions and answers about financial products and money management. Now, one of our largest tasks has been to draft rules to restore confidence and common sense to our mortgage market. As you all, uh, all well know, in the lead up to the crisis, many mortgage businesses fail to conduct the very due diligence necessary to safely and prudently underwrite mortgages. Some joined their customers in wishful thinking. Some tricked people into believing they could afford loans that they could not. Some actually falsified documents. Certainly, some consumers should have known better and made bad choices, but too many consumers could not recognize the risks that they were taking until it was too late. Our mortgage origination work marks a return to traditional mortgage lending. Our loan originator compensation rules restrict certain practices that created financial incentives to push people into loans with higher interest rates. Under our ability to repay or qualified mortgage rule, lenders must now make a reasonable good faith determination that the consumer can actually afford the mortgage before they make the loan. Now obviously lenders do not have a crystal ball they cannot predict if someone will lose a job or have an unexpected financial emergency, but they must look at a consumer's income or assets and at the debt and must weigh them against the monthly payments over the long term. 
In other words, lenders must revert to responsible lending. Our second back to basics regulation is in mortgage servicing. We recognize that servicers play a critical role in the mortgage market. Servicers collect and apply payments to loans. When necessary, they can work out modifications to the terms of a loan, and they handle the difficult foreclosure process. Now, you know better than most that because of all the things that servicers do, their effects on borrowers and communities can be profound. Wrongful foreclosures are disruptive. Homes were lost forever. Families wrenched from their communities. Children lost their friends. And the biggest financial asset for that family was taken with a process that sometimes ended with a sheriff. Our new rules of the road have been in effect since January. Like our mortgage origination regulations, they embody a back-to-basics approach. Simply put, consumers should not be hit with surprises by those responsible for collecting their payments. If a consumer takes out a mortgage, our rules require servicers to keep the consumer informed about the loan and to investigate and fix errors which are brought to their attention. Our new rules will help borrowers know where they stand. Servicers now must send monthly statements showing how they applied the monthly payment. The statement puts all the important information in one place showing the interest rate, the loan balance, escrow account balance, and how the payments were applied. To clean up the mortgage servicing market, we're also taking aim at practices that have given too many consumers the runaround. Servicers now know that they must perform basic customer service functions, such as returning phone calls or answering answering customer inquiries. Moreover, our rules require servicers to let consumers know about available options to save a home or to work out a problem in making payments. In sum, we expect servicers to conduct outreach to ensure that all consumers in default know their options. We expect servicers to assess loss mitigation applications with care so that consumers who qualify can get the loss mitigation that saves them and the investor from foreclosure. We expect servicers to pay exceptionally close attention to servicing transfers, and we want the servicing industry to understand that we will as well. This process should be seamless for consumers in our view. Our rules mandate policies and procedures to transfer all information and documents in order to ensure that the new servicer has accurate information about the consumer's account. Servicing transfers where the new servicers are not honoring existing permanent or trial loan modifications will not be tolerated. Struggling borrowers being told to pay incorrect higher amounts because of the failure to honor an in-process loan modification and then being pushed with, into foreclosure for their inability to pay the incorrect amounts will not be tolerated. There will be no more shell games where the first servicer says the transfer ended all of its responsibility to consumers and the second servicer says it got a data dump missing critical documents. We, thank you. we expect servicers to turn to force place insurance as a last resort, rather than using it as a profit center that feeds off consumers' distress. At the end of the day, foreclosures are an important part of the business but they shouldn't happen unless they're necessary and they must be done according to relevant law. We expect these simple protections to help prevent needless foreclosures, which is best for borrowers, best for lenders, and best for our entire economy. We mean to end a failed, progress, a failed process in which too many struggling homeowners have been kept in the dark about where they stand. American consumers deserve better. They're entitled to be treated with respect, with dignity, and with fairness. Last month, we took other steps to improve the mortgage market by proposing the expansion of the information collected on the, under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. Knowing more about how lenders are serving communities and consumers will help us better identify possible discriminatory lending patterns. We also launched an online tool so that consumer groups and others can e have easy access to this public information, something that advocates, industry professionals, and researchers have sought for decades. The tool allows people to evaluate trends in their local mortgage markets. 
Now, last year at this very event, Director Cordray took, uh, took the stage to express concern that discretionary pricing in auto finance increases the risk of pricing disparities among consumers based upon race, national origin, and potentially other prohibited bases. In December, in partnership with the Department of Justice, we ordered Ally Bank, an indirect auto lender, to pay $98 million to address their auto loan pricing structure. We believe the structure has caused discrimination against more than 235,000 minority consumers, specifically African American, Hispanic, and Asian and Pacific Islander borrowers. Ally must pay $80 million in restitution to consumers and $18 million in civil money penalties to resolve these issues. This was the federal government's largest auto loan discrimination settlement in history. Now additional areas of concern and focus for us include debt collection, consumer reporting, and student loans. One in 10 consumers currently has debts in collection. The best estimates are that 30 million Americans came out of the financial crisis with one or more debts in collection for amounts that now are average $1,500 per person. Collection of consumer debt serves an important role in the proper functioning of our consumer credit markets. But certain debt collection practices have been a source of frustration for many consumers, generating a heavy volume of consumer complaints at all levels of government. For example, we recently filed a lawsuit against Cash Call, an online servicer. We believe they violated federal law by seeking to collect on loans that were rendered void or otherwise nullified because the loans violated state caps on interest rates or state licensing requirements. We also ordered Cash America, one of the largest short-term small dollar lenders in the country, to refund consumers up to $14 million for robo-signing debt collection documents and illegally overcharging service members. They were also ordered to pay a $5 million fine for these violations and for destroying records in advance of our examination. In November, we published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking asking consumers for feedback about their experiences with debt collections and asking the industry for information about their practices. We extended the deadline for comments to ensure that we received feedback from anyone who wanted to comment, including consumers, advocates, and other important stakeholders. We want to ensure that collectors are seeking to recover debts from the right person in the right amounts. In particular, we're concerned that the accuracy of account information degrades as, it is, as it's passed from the original creditor to debt collection firms or debt buyers. Consumers are also challenged that they cannot control the information that goes into their credit reports and can have difficulty correcting the errors they find in them. For consumers with errors in their reports, the damage can be severe. We have issued a bulletin putting companies that supply information to credit reporting agencies on notice of their obligations to review consumer disputes and to correct inaccurate information. We have also completed larger participant rulemakings for the markets of consumer debt collection and consumer reporting companies. Accordingly, larger players in both of these critical markets are now subject to oversight through the Bureau's supervision program. Our enforcement extends to all debt collectors and consumer reporting agencies. Now lastly, student loans comprise the second largest consumer debt market. For any recent graduates in the audience, this reality hits perhaps a little too close to home. Student loans allow many Americans to pursue opportunities through higher education that they could not otherwise afford. However, the cost of higher education has been rising steadily and more students and families are taking out loans in order to afford college. The result is that more than 40 million Americans collectively hold approximately $1.2 trillion in outstanding student loan balances. These rising levels of student loan debt can also have a domino effect on our economy, slowing household formation, discouraging business startups, inhibiting first-time home ownership, and limiting the mobility and options of younger graduates who might otherwise consider perhaps working in rural communities or as teachers. We know that student loan borrowers rely on the business practices of financial companies once they have taken on the debt. Student loan servicers have come to play an increasingly important role 
in graduate ec economics futures. We have identified a number of potential servicing concerns in this market based on complaints and other market data. These complaints bear resemblance to those voiced by struggling homeowners. Servicing personnel without authority to provide assistance, no clear options when borrowers run into trouble, and a raft of retention and payment processing problems that leave borrowers stymied with no clear recourse. As we've seen in the mortgage servicing market, when borrowers' loans get transferred, they may experience lost paperwork or processing errors that result in late fees, damaged credit, and in some cases, delinquency and default. We have serious concerns that these are the same sort of systemic breakdowns that millions of homeowners faced when dealing with their mortgage servicer. Because student loan servicing is so important, we recently completed our third larger, mark, larger participant rulemaking covering non-banks in the student loan servicing market. Our supervisory jurisdiction now complements our existing enforcement authority with respect to the larger non-banks in this market and our existing authority over large banks. The Bureau has also developed new resources to help students make more informed decisions when it comes to higher education. Our Paying for College set of tools, which is available on our website, is designed to help families consider the options and assess the costs and risks in terms that are easier to understand. We urge everyone to spread the word about these tools and to make use of them. In conclusion, a renewed and appropriate focus on consumer protection will go a long way towards preventing our problems, that, the problems that gave rise to the financial crisis. Our goal is this will also allow substantial opportunities for all responsible companies to innovate and compete in the marketplace. Put another way, we're attempting to recalibrate the relationship between consumers and financial service providers by ensuring it is grounded in fairness, in transparency, and in choice. I'd like to recognize once again all the work that you're doing to help us get there and for your dedication to the betterment of all communities, especially the most vulnerable. Thank you very much.